had three stress fractures in my back, I competed on those. That was in the November 2015 and uh, that was sort of my whole world crumbling, falling down like I'd completely snapped my, my tibia and fibula, like my, my leg was facing the wrong way. Like Doctors, nurses, everything, uh, you'll be lucky to be walking normal. In 2009, your dad sadly passed away. How did how did you cope at that younger age with that? Um, the World Championships, Commonwealth Games and Olympic medals with Team GB in Wales, dealing with lead breaks and much, much more along the way. Tune in to this incredible, inspirational episode now. I want to I want to show everybody. I want to show the world what what my true potential is. Before you start this episode, please can you click subscribe below and follow our social handles in the description. It's a massive help and it keeps you up to date with all the exciting announcements from the podcast. Thanks very much, Brim, for coming in to see us. Appreciate Thank you giving us some time. Thank you for having me on. No, pleasure. Um, right, we're going to throw you straight in at the deep end and give you, like we do with everyone that comes in, we have about a, a bit of a minute challenge. Okay. So if you're up for it, so um, and you're a competitive guy, so hopefully you will be. Um, so I just wanted to take, just to give the listeners and viewers a bit of a snapshot about you real quick, if they don't know much about you. So one minute tops, maybe one minute and a half, if we're, if we're lucky. Just go from kind of Bryn, younger Bryn, upbringing to present day. Just try and travel your life story in about a minute, minute and a half. Okay. And see how you get on. <laughs> that's, yeah? a, that's a challenge. Challenge accepted. it in that, absolutely. Go on then, let's go. Um, yeah, so I'm Brim Bevan. I'm currently 25 years old. Um, I started gymnastics when I was two years old. Very hyperactive, very naughty, mischievous, uh, jumping off the furniture, breaking everything in the house. So mum threw me into gymnastics. Um, I'd, I got scouted probably as a two-year-old kid straight into sort of the elite program. Um, I had a very successful junior career. Um, my senior career started in 2015. Um, yeah, Europeans, World Championships, Olympic Games. Um, I've been to most of the major championships. Uh, last one on the list for me is the Commonwealth Games, which I'm hoping to tick off this year. Um, yeah, and just really do the country and my family proud. Perfect. Do you know what? That's probably, I would say, the most efficient one minute that we've had of any guest <laughs> so far. So I'll give you a little a little round of applause for that. So that was good. Um, I think with that, that element, it kind of forces you to hone in on stuff that's maybe more important, that sticks out in your mind yeah and then we can dig in a little bit deeper so that gives everyone a good a good outset so take me back to kind of like early years Bryn then so you mentioned about um getting into gymnastics really really early sort of from a couple of years old so yeah. talk to me about your sort of early years upbringing family what did that all look like um well I originally got into gymnastics I think like I said in the little summary just to, to waste a little bit of energy to make it a little bit easier for my parents to to handle me yeah. um I started in sort of a, a swim and gym class, so it wasn't it wasn't ever meant to be anything serious. Um, it was just a little bit of sport, a little bit of activity, just to, I guess, learn to um, handle my energy and use my body in sort of the correct ways, especially if I was jumping around the house, learning to, I guess, fall correctly and yeah. stop trying to break the house and, and, and the furniture. Um, You're a bit of a handful. Um, well, <laughs> I'd like to say no, but I think my parents would tell a different story. <laughs> Good, fair enough. So I was going to say I, I was a very energetic kid myself, but rather than gymnastics, it was wrestling moves on the sofa <laughs> and wrecking tables and different things, trying to trying to do what all the people on the telly can do. But so in terms of your upbringing, so they shoved you into sort of gymnastics to kind of burn that energy and stuff. So tell me a bit about kind of your family arrangement, siblings, parents, stuff like that. How was your kind of upbringing? as well as your gymnastics at that time? Um, my my parents have, have always been very, very supportive of everything I do. Um, they was never pushy parents. I wasn't I wasn't forced into gymnastics. It was, I wasn't ever forced into sort of a, an elite pathway. It was just enjoy what you do, have fun. Have fun while you're doing everything that you want to. Um, Family life has always been good. My my parents have always tried to, like I said, support everything I do, try and give me everything I, I want or needed within reason without being, um, I guess, spoiled. It was, 
yeah, I mean, money has always been a bit tight with, with my family and I'm so grateful for everything they, they did manage to do as a kid, even into an adult with, with my mum, everything she does to help me still these days. Um, I I have two siblings, half siblings um, from my dad's side. I'm not so close with that sort of side of the family. Um, but I, I know they still sort of follow my my journey and everything I do in gymnastics, outside of gymnastics as well. Um, yeah, I think the, yeah, it's always been good, always when I was younger. And I think now, sort of, as I'm getting older, as I'm starting to think about other things outside of sport, outside of gymnastics, I think I'm really realising how important family is like and being grateful for everything my parents did do for me at the time and sort of wanting to pass that on to um i guess my family there's no little um kid is running around just yet but i've uh i've my partner taylor um within sort of the the, the last two years we, we've just got a flat together um we, we've got a little well a, a massive dog he's still only a puppy he's only 18 months <laughs> what but, have you got He's a cane corso. Um, okay. So the reason I originally went, do, do you know, my, my missus only wanted a little sausage dog. Yeah. Um, so they are I, quite so, cute, aren't they, little sausage dogs? I, I couldn't be seen walking one. <laughs> uh, that's, that's not really a masculine dog. No. It, oh, it's not even about masculine, but just I, I couldn't walk a sausage dog. Their, their back end hops. I don't yeah. know if you've seen them because they're a bit longer than usual. So it's <laughs> like they walk, but if you look to them to the side, because I, I used to live in a house that was opposite five or six sausage dogs and the lady used to walk them two, three times a day and you should just see this little back end just hop, 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 hop as, it, as she drags them down the street. It did look cute. But. I think I think sausage dogs as well, obviously, because of their, their abnormal size and stuff, they, they do have a lot of health problems and then I didn't want to be walking it and then after like suddenly after two steps down the road, after to pick so, it up and yeah, carry it down back, the it? street as well. Um, but yeah, my, my dog Storm, um, a, a massive cane call. So the, the reason I originally got him was because I was still traveling a lot. So yeah. more for a bit of um, protection and safety for for my, my partner. Um, and he, he's, he's done a brilliant job looking after him and, and vice versa. But yeah, so partner, flat, dog, um, due to get married to, to Taylor um, sort okay. of later on this year. So. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Are you getting involved in the planning for that or are you leaving everything to... <laughs> I've, I've tried to stay away from everything. Um, I think it's the easiest way for us blokes to, to avoid sort of the disagreements and arguments. Listen, I think e- even if she asks... From experience, even if if they, even if they ask you what your opinions are, it's a bit of a minefield, isn't it? There, there's only probably one not going to do what stuff. you want anyway. <laughs> it's like, I, I always I always think that it's good to say. So what would you think? <laughs> what would you think? What would you want to do then? What, what what do you feel about that? And then just copy whatever they say. <laughs> Job done. <laughs> Easy life. Yeah, I I tend to just say, well, I I prefer this one, but. It's... It's in your court. It's your choice. I like it. Put your put your views across and then step back and sit on the fence. Exactly. <laughs> Every good man does that, I think. Um, so that's happening in what back end of this year? Yeah. So hopefully the the Commonwealth Games and then actually like a week or two after I I get back from the games, um, we we're, we're getting married abroad. So we're going to Greece oh, for our wedding. Lovely. Um, do you know what? It's it's actually it shortens the the party size yeah like you only get the people that really really want to be there and, and yeah. support you and do you know what? it's actually so much cheaper to get married abroad yeah and uh, get a town while doing it look i think there's i mean it, there's tons of benefits from from getting married abroad i think i think the good thing is you can have that niche set of people that you mentioned about as you sort of grown up into where you are now the kind of realizing that importance of family and close friendships with people and as you get older i think you your your circle tends to decrease with most people doesn't it and you get a little bit more spending time with the people that are really really important to you and they're the people that you'll probably end up that will be present in that moment in that special day rather than 100 people that you might you might not only see 20 people 30 people on a regular basis 60 70 people could be people that you just see maybe once every couple of years yeah i think the the hardest thing that i've found is obviously like throughout my my sporting journey there has been lots of ups and downs and there, there's been points where I've isolated myself from from everybody family friends really? even, even um, to a certain degree myself at times and I, I, like I said the older I'm getting the more I'm realizing how important it is to 
to have the support network there for you like the the select few that you really know can help you even if that is only a couple of words whether that's a little tap on the back whether that's a little kick up the bum to tell you to get on with it and you can't do everything absolutely isolated by yourself all the time yeah. sometimes you, you do need people there to to support you so when you're going through those sort of times then so what made you go into those moments and how did you feel you kind of managed to drag yourself out of them? Because I think everybody goes through tough moments. Everyone has hard times, don't they? And it's definitely a topic that comes up on people that interact with us via social media on the podcast is kind of, this is what I'm going through now. And, you know, I've lost a, a partner or I've lost a parent or, you know, there's an illness in my family or I've been sacked from a job or I'm miserable at my life and my job or whatever it is. There's always people that are going through those tough moments and we've all been through them. But what were your sort of toughest moments, do you think, in your kind of life, career? And how did you face those and try and conquer them? Um, there's, Like I said, there's been a lot of moments for me. Um, the, the first one for me was um, 2009, but really sort of two years leading up into 2009. Um, I I lost my dad to, to cancer, to a, a rare cancer called multiple my, myeloma. Okay. Um, and I, I think I was only 12 years old at the time when he wow. actually passed away. But two years leading up to that point, he was in and out of hospital. I wasn't attending school. I wasn't attending training practice for gymnastics. And... I was really trying to make the most of my time, spend all of my time with him to help look after him. Because at the point we we didn't realise it, it was going to end. We, yeah. Um, and, and I don't think so. That that's the that was the first one for me. And then there's been lots of injuries. There's, yeah. there's, I've had three stress fractures in my back. I competed on those. I didn't know at the time. I knew I was in excruciating pain, but I just kept pushing through because I, I didn't want to let go of a dream for me. I didn't want to let my, myself and my teammates down to, to lose the opportunity to get a medal. Um, I've broken my leg f three times now. I've broken my wrist, dislocated my shoulder, and all these different things, whether that's family, whether that's relatives passing away, whether that's injury, whether that's losing a job, I don't think there's really one fits all blueprint to, yeah. to handle it, how to deal with it. I think everybody does have to find their own way to to come through the other side um and unfortunately that does take time there, there isn't no quick fix to it but the most important thing is is our mind um as soon as as soon as we become negative and we we think things are are happening to us on on purpose i think that's really when things start sliding downhill even faster even further um, you, you've really got to try and find some positives from it. And oh, like you're, you're waking up each day, you know what I mean? Like things might be happening, you might be a little bit sad, but you are waking up each day and some people don't don't get that luxury, um, whatever they are going through. Um, so yeah, I think positivity is, is one of the big things it, and it's difficult, it's, it's not easy to find positivity every single day. And at times, even me now, even though things are kind of good, they're kind of great right now, there are days where you do wake up feeling a little bit more down than usual whether, and you don't, you don't feel happy, you, you don't want to get on with your day, but you have to go through the motions and then come the next day, then you can find some more positivity. Um, and I, f I think really, like I said, how I'm growing as I'm getting older, I'm I'm finding my, my friends, my family, my support network more and more important. I think making sure that you are talking to people, opening up to people, and that doesn't even have to be everybody in, in your support network. It might be one or two select people that you trust. For, for me, the main people that I speak to are, my partner is my mum um, and is my, my coach, Scott. Um, and then I'm lucky enough to, at the moment, be able to have access to psychologists, psychiatrists, but I, some people don't don't get that. But I really think that talking helps, like just letting those few close people know, like, I, I don't feel right today, I, I, I'm a little bit down. And 
those people can say to you, is there anything I can do to help? Mm. Um, and so sometimes there isn't going to be anything they can do to help, but at least they know and they can go out of their way to be a little bit nicer to you or at least not try and annoy you or, or yeah. I guess, piss you off further. Yeah, I think it's that awareness. I'm really glad you brought that point in because I think someone could, from the outside, sort of look at you and think, look, you're a successful guy. Fair enough, you've had ups and downs the same as what everybody has but you're a successful guy you're in the public eye you're competing for your country you've got so much more going for you than maybe joe blogs on the street so i think it's nice for people to know that wherever whatever you're doing wherever you are however successful you are or not everyone still sometimes wakes up feeling like shit yeah you know i i'll probably have a couple of days a month where i wake up and i think not just oh, i can't be bothered today but just generally feel like shit and, you, and you're like you know what you could have a really good day ahead of you but i think what Go, going back to what you said there around talking to people what kind of uh, and again a reason for doing this and other things is what i will inadvertently then go and do is go and i built a bit of a gym in the garage yeah. over lockdown same as a lot of people did um not that you can actually tell you're gonna say you're in much better <laughs> shape than me mate you've got a, a big old muscles there um but i'll try and do a bit three four times a week in the gym in the garage but when i feel like shit the first place i'm going is there not because i want to lock myself away yeah, because that's my, that's my time. That's my little sanctuary. It's me that uses it. I can go and put a podcast on in the background. I can put some music on that I know is a certain playlist that will get me feeling a little bit better in a certain set of songs. I, I can go and listen to something that might be a bit more motivational, a bit more positive, and then I'll walk back into the house. And by the time I'm back into the house, I've got to walk the dog, and my partner's awake, mm -hmm. or my kids are awake, and I've got things that I need to do. So I'm inadvertently kind of transporting myself from a negative place through my process into somewhere where I can think about it, deal with it and actually think, well, listen, my life is, is good compared to the majority of other people. We all have our ups and downs in your own head. And like you said, the mind's a powerful thing. It can work for you and work massively against you, whoever you are. But getting a little bit of reality is really, really important, I think, to deal with difficult situations no matter how difficult the situation is already so, there's always somebody worse off there's already somebody that's been there already be some, somebody that has found difficulty in something that's more than what you have and i'm a really big believer in that there's always somebody better off there's always somebody worse off and actually step back look at the whole landscape and think let's just take a little bit of a reality check here yes certain things are difficult but in an hour, that might not be the case. In a day, that might not be the case. And just trying to be open to your emotions changing rather than trying to lock them down. Yeah, exactly. I think I think you you've you've highlighted a, a, a few things there. Anyway, like for for the normal for the average person, like it's it's great to go and exercise. Whether that's going to the gym, like you said, having your own space to be able to lift some weights, listen to some music, attempt that, to lift some weights. <laughs> <laughs> whether that's going outside, going for a run, but then. I think the thing that I struggled with most on some of my down periods or more negative attitudes is what do you do when you're a full-time athlete already? Because for me, my escape isn't to go to a gym and yeah. do a workout, press some weights or go for a run. Because yeah. I'm working out pretty you're doing much it every, yeah. every day for, for my job, for my living. And I have done over the past 20 years. So it's a what? what's my escape, what makes me feel a bit happier. And again, like I said, the the support network, I think that's where that comes in. And, and for me, again, not everybody has access to it, but I've, I've got my partner, I've now got my, my dog Storm. And for me, my escape has been my my with my partner taking my dog storm on a walk getting outside and into sort of the nature whether that's walk through the woods whether that's walk down the river just getting outside and sort of taking that moment feeling the present feeling the breeze outside the the noises the cars going past um just really bringing myself back to to that moment it's interesting you say that because i think social media depicts a different story for people especially people in the public eye which is actually nothing of what you've just said the social media story is the things that will make you happy are holidays x amount of times a year beaches x amount of times a year what car you're driving you know what house you live in and all these you know how much money you're making and who your contacts are and all this sort of stuff whereas the reality is and i'm glad you mentioned that because i take a lot of personal happiness in the fact that now if i go back into my 20s it was all work 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 and i still work a lot now but it was all work 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 and i wouldn't make time 
for family. I wouldn't make time for my partner. I wouldn't make time for my kids when I look at it in certain areas. I look back and it's embarrassing, but that was just what it was because I thought, well, actually, I'm head down. I'm the bloke. I need to provide. I need to go and build a future. It's my job to go and do that. Whereas I look at it completely different now. Like, I'll, I'll, I go out and walk the dog every single morning. Thank you very much for supporting the podcast over the last sort of few months or so. Um, We're now getting thousands and thousands of downloads and views every single episode, but that is not all. Big news to come. We're looking for a sponsor for the podcast. And the reason for that is we're looking to take our thousands of downloaders and viewers to tens and hundreds of thousands of downloads and viewers. So if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, if you're a business owner that wants to get some extra exposure to thousands of people per week, please get in touch. Let's talk at thesilententrepreneur.co.uk. I want to talk about before we came on about cooking and stuff like that. I'm a shit cook, don't get me wrong. But we, but the reason why I do the, the HelloFresh isn't because I want to go and cook a posh meal because, trust me, what I do with HelloFresh does not depict what is on that bit of paper when you receive it. It looks a lot different, a lot worse. But it's an ability for me, even if it's once a week or twice a week, to have half an hour where we can have a conversation whilst we cook together, for example. It's those little things, the simple things that value and your your out so like you said you, you're working out it's kind of part of your, your day job it's your life your out is a simple thing like going and walk the dog with your partner like that that's really powerful and that's really important i think for people to understand whoever you are whether you're public eye or not it's the simple things that matter yeah you, you've got to have things that are accessible that that can cheer you up and make you happy mm-hmm. like not everybody's in a position to be able to go and spend thousands of pounds on a holiday just for a little escape to yeah. to make themselves a little bit happier. And that that's only a moment's happiness. Like yeah. That might buy them two more weeks of a few more smiles, but then they've got to come back to reality. They've got to come back to their job. And, the, and that reality is probably not... lower than where it was before because you've had a, exactly. a real high, haven't you? Yeah. Exactly. So I think it's just finding things that are accessible, like, like I said, not everybody has that money. Not everybody can drive a nice car. Like within the last few weeks, I, I've had. I used to drive a, a nice. Well, it was an old car, but a nice car. I used to have a, a BMW 3 Series, and it was it was my dream car from when I was a little kid because that's what my dad used to drive. Yeah. Um, and uh, that got written off a couple of weeks ago. So yeah. now I've got to go and buy a, a cheaper alternative. But that that doesn't bring me happiness that doesn't define me or that isn't the main part of of my life like it it still goes on I'm still waking up every day I've still got my partner my dog I'm still doing gymnastics I'm I'm still going to the Commonwealth there's still lots of other things to look forward to apart from that one small blip that might have might have taken my smile away momentarily yeah i've got a question for you so when you were going through in 2009 you mentioned or a couple of years leading up to 2009 you were sort of 10 12 years old when when your dad sadly passed away so how did how did you cope at that younger age with that because you know you mentioned about not going necessarily going to school all the time and your kind of gymnastics took a bit of a dip and and that sort of thing so how how did you get through that at such a such a young age and does that kind of is there any elements that you can take that you take from that to present day um i think for me it was routine like it although i my routine was messed up i i wasn't necessarily going to school or, or gymnastics i was still waking up at the same time every day my routine become waking up getting on the train going to london looking after my dad with with my mum um I guess one of the, on the brighter side of, of that that story, is I, I spent a lot of time with my my mum throughout that period. Yeah. And I think that that made my relationship with her a little bit stronger and I felt closer with her because I was always sort of closer to my, my dad as I was growing up, like, because I perceived him as sort of the, the fun parent, whereas my mum was sort of the stricter one that sort of enforced the the rules or told me off if I was a little bit naughty. Um, And, you know, again, I I was lucky enough to be in a position where I had other other people, other outside support. So the school was sending work home to me. Although I wasn't attending school, I wasn't attending the classes, I was still able to do some of the work at home. Um, And... uh, amazingly i still managed to pass all my exams but that that did leave me in a position thinking 
what could I have done? Like, could I have got better results if I had actually attended school, if I had actually attended all these classes? Um, and then the sort of gymnastics side of things, although, although I wasn't training consistently, um, I, I'd still managed to go to competitions and sort of pull it out of the bag. I, I wasn't training. I was eating far too much because at the time, my way of dealing with it was comfort eating. Um, I was eating a lot on travel, on the road, so not choosing the, the, not having the smartest of choices of food. So that was in London, there's a McDonald's there, there's a KFC yeah. there. I was eating what I could, when I could. Yeah. Um, and that, that really had a big impact on, on my gymnastics. Like a, I, I put on a lot of weight, I become a lot bigger, a lot fatter at the time. Um, and gymnastics was becoming very difficult. Um, I mean, imagine putting on 10, 10 or 20 kilos and then trying to jump as high as you can off the floor. Yeah. One, you're probably not going to get as high and two, you're going to hit the floor a lot bloody harder, aren't you? Yeah. Um, and that that's the impact that it had on my gymnastics. Um, and although I wasn't able to necessarily train or do the routines that I could that, uh, and fulfilling my full potential at that time, I was still going to competitions. I was still pulling something out of the bag and yeah. hitting all my routines at them competitions and still coming away with medals. Um, and I think that's when one of my, my main coach, Scott Han, sort of really saw the, the potential, the talent, like mm. how is he still, how is he still doing this? Like, with yeah. everything he's going through, with all this extra weight, how is he, st like this kid's talented, he's got something, like we need to, we need to sort of protect him and make sure he comes out the other side of this. So Scott's been with you for a long time? Yeah, Scott's, Scott's been my, my coach since I was probably five or six years old. Mm -hmm. um, Throughout that period of my, my dad being in the hospital and, and passing away, I think there was maybe a, a year where I moved to, away from Scott's group because I, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to pursue the, the, the elite, the professional pathway anymore. Um, but then that, that little time period made me realise how much I, I did want to do gymnastics and I wanted to make something of it. So what would Scott say about you as your sort of main two or three qualities? From knowing you for such a long time um he he loves to say that i'm a real competitive animal um i mean if you if you find some of the the videos and stories online from from my life when i was a bit younger like one of them being the hard way to success yeah um, i've seen that yeah and sort of showing that period of of when my my dad was in hospital and when he did pass away um He'll tell a similar story of how I wasn't training, how I was very overweight and I was still going to these competitions and winning and coming away, coming away with medals. So he loves to say that I'm a competitive animal and I've, I've got this switch where I go into that competition environment and I want to I want to show everybody, I want to show the world what, what my true potential is um, and I can just... I have been able to switch it on. I, you don't know how long that lasts in some competitions. You might have a few mistakes or blips, but yeah. I think some people do sort of fall in under pressure, don't they? And other people can rise to it. And I'm, I've been lucky enough to be one of the people that have managed to, to rise of, rise to it over the years. Um, thing, second thing, just be how I've managed to overcome and face adversity so many times um and sort of come out the other side like it's it's never it's never a failure it's always a lesson whether that's an injury whether that's a, a relative passing away whatever you're going through there is usually something you can you can take from it so like with, with my dad passing away it was showing that i have got this co this competitive nature um for some of my injuries, it showed me that I needed to work smarter. I needed to work a little bit harder. Um, maybe not as many repetitions, but make sure that I get the work done to a good quality, a good standard. Um, and I, I think the third thing would probably just be my 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 passion, my my drive to succeed, like that throughout these periods with, with my dad, with, with these injuries, there's been so many times when I could have just given up and walked away and decided, do you know what, this 
this is this is hard like I, mm. I don't want to put this much effort in yeah um but I, I've never lost sight of sort of the the long term goal of the major competitions and results that I I have wanted to achieve um I started gymnastics when I was 2 years old um I got into the competitive side probably when I was about 6 5 or 6 and then it wasn't really until 2008 the the Beijing Olympics where I really decided gymnastics is what I want to do. I want I want to go to the Olympic Games. I want to make yeah. something of this. Yeah. Um and, uh, and that's a promise you made to your dad, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think that's one of the my biggest drives for success. Um throughout all these periods like I that's that's always been at the back of my mind. You've had plenty of times you could have quit because, you know, you reeled off about 10 minutes ago, six or seven different injuries, which for the amount of physicality that you go through with your body, with the things that you do, I mean, things like the horse, it's physical, body weight, you know, it's a massive toll on your body, the the rings. I still don't know how anybody <laughs> can actually have the strength to do that. My, my friend James, he owns a gymnasium and he's done some lower level competing on on things like the rings and different different other bits and pieces and he's an absolute tank absolute tank even nowadays and he's in such good shape and to be able to support your body weight in that way if, with that amount of control in that particular exercise is to me ridiculous it's just it looks impossible so do you defying gravity in that in that moment but it's it's done in a controlled manner um so how yeah how you had sort of breaks and dislocations and stuff and kept going do you think you owe that down to that overarching thing in the back of your mind, which is I must, at that time, I must make it to the Olympics because that's the promise that I've made. Is that the sole, one of the main drivers for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the, I went I went to the Olympic Games in 2016 in, in Rio. Um, and uh, so at the World Championships in 2015, we come away with a silver medal as a team, which was, was making history. That was the first medal. It, yeah. GB had won for that, wasn't it? In that sort of a championship. Yes, yeah. exactly. And and that was a, that was one year out from the Olympic Games. So for me at that time, it was I, I'm going to be in the team now. I've, it's a huge I've been high part point, of the isn't team it? Yeah. That, that's made history. We're a year out. There's no way this Olympic team is happening without me. Um, and a couple of weeks later, that was when I broke my leg for the first time. Um, that was in the November 2015, and. Uh, that was sort of my whole world crumbling, falling down like that. Because that's that, years in the making, isn't it? Like years and years in the making. Not just training, but mentality, emotion. That's Yeah, I, like I was always led to believe that, that 2016, that Olympic Games would was going to be my first shot. That was where I was going to make a name for myself. Um, and uh, as soon as I got in, rushed into hospital after breaking my leg for the first time, I... It wasn't just a break. Like I'd, I'd completely snapped my my tibia and fibula. Like my my leg was facing the wrong way. Like I couldn't have really done an awful lot more damage. To How did it happen? Um, I was I was on the vault um, at, at the British Team Championships only probably a few weeks after coming back from that that silver medal at the World Championships, and I'd reduced my routines just to get through. So maybe it was just sort of routines that I hadn't practiced enough because I'd lowered the level, but it was stuff that I could do in my sleep. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether I lost concentration. It's just one of those freak things. Um, I don't know what, what happened, but you know, looking back at it now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it because I think that's one of, that had been one of my defying moments that, that taught me the most. And that made me realize that I needed to work a, a bit smarter and make the most of what I what I had got. But when I got into the hospital, the doctors, nurses, everything were, you'll be lucky to be walking normal in, in a year's time, wow. like, let alone be at the Olympic Games. Um, and like, you, you can imagine- Do you remember that moment? Yeah. Yeah, so I can. Take us back to that moment and just try and dig deeper into that. So how, how did that make you feel? What was the kind of thoughts going through your head when you're effectively being told your Olympic dream's gone? that you've been dreaming of for your life and you might not actually walk properly again because that's crushing news really yeah i, I mean you can, I, I i i remember literally 
waking up from sort of the emergency operation. I'm I'm still in the hospital bed. I'm I'm on a, a morphine drip and the doctors and nurse, nurses having these conversations with me. Um, and like me being a, an arrogant, stubborn 18 year old kid at the time was, what are you telling me? Like, of course I'm going. Um, yeah. And then it wasn't until probably the, the, the coming days where I was like, okay, this this is gonna be hard. Like, I don't know how, I'm, like, there's no way that I'm letting this, this dream slip from me. Like I was, I was back in the gym the, the day after my operation. Like wow. I I couldn't do gymnastics at the time, but what I could do was make sure that I was staying fit, was making sure that I was getting stronger. So as soon as I, I could get this boot off, I was I was ready to rehab. I, I was gonna make sure that I was losing weight, I was on I was eating correctly. So when again this boot came off and I could start my rehab, there's less weight, there's less pressure going through my leg. I needed to make sure that I could do everything to not let this slip from me. Like I said, 2016 was, for me, was what I got brought up to believe was gonna be my first shot. And like we mentioned before as well, it was, it was a promise that I, I made to my dad that I was gonna to go to Olympic games and that I was gonna do my absolute best to come away with a medal, a gold medal. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, the, the promise was something that, that played on my mind a lot. I think there was, there was so many times where I could have just given up and walked away from the sport, given up with sort of the whole rehab and recovery journey and process. But I didn't I didn't want to break the, the promise that I'd, I'd made. Like that I gave my word and I didn't want to let this slip. Like it had been 20, nearly 20 years in the making at the yeah. time and I wasn't prepared to, to walk away from that. So I think people would have understand why if you had it done because it's a serious trauma, you know, with a top level athlete, not many athletes you know, get through those sort of things. But you, with you having multiple things that have happened, um, I think, you know, it shows real character strength and resilience, like you mentioned before, dealing with that adversity, real resilience to come back from something that could have, you know, well, let's be honest, it could have crippled you. You might not have been walking, but you you then fast forward a small amount of time, you're competing, you're competing in the Olympics, which is the top of the top and the elite of the elite. I, I've been, I've been, yeah, I've been lucky to have the right support network behind me the whole time. Like throughout that period, uh, that was one of the times when I I isolated myself and was it? Right. I wasn't really speaking to to most friends, family. I think the the two main people for me throughout that journey, coming back from snapping my leg to making the Olympic Games, was my my coach Scott and and my mum. They those are the only two people that. I was really speaking to that were what was the time scale between you having that injury and the Olympic Games starting um, so it wasn't a massive time frame was it no I mean I've got I, I do a bit of keynotes speaking and stuff and I've got all the the actual dates yeah. and weeks and stuff written down but if you if you break it down it's pretty like from the this the selection when the team was going to be announced it probably had five or six months from wow from yeah from that's incredible going from kind of operation to competing at that level in six months thank you very much for supporting the podcast over the last sort of few months or so um, we're now getting thousands and thousands of downloads and views every single episode but that is not all Big news to come, we're looking for a sponsor for the podcast and the reason for that is we're looking to take our thousands of downloaders and viewers to tens and hundreds of thousands of downloads and viewers. So if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, if you're a business owner that wants to get some extra exposure to thousands of people per week, please get in touch. Let's talk at thesilententrepreneur.co.uk. Yeah, there, there was so, uh, although there was a journey, it was uh, like there's a saying, isn't it? Keep falling forwards. and. Um, I'd done my leg in, in the November. I was back in the gym the next day. My first competition back was in the February. So that's only like six, that's to, crazy, yeah. six to 10 weeks after breaking my leg. And I wasn't doing dismounts at that time, but I could be back in a competition environment with a crowd, putting my arm up under pressure. Yeah. Um, and it was all important experience that I needed on this journey. and. That first competition back, like I said, I wasn't doing dismounts, and but I had a 
there was a little surprise that I had in store. So I, w I wasn't doing floor, I wasn't doing vault, and I wasn't doing dismounts and everything else. But the Parallel Bars is, is my favorite apparatus. Yeah. It's my best apparatus. And I've always had this natural gift and ability. But like, don't get me wrong, I work hard, but I, I've always been able to just do things on, on P-Bar, um, on the Parallel Bars. And I made it through this routine. It was a new routine for me at the time as well. I got all the way to the end and thought, I'm gonna do dismount. Like, I'd, yeah, I've got, I can win a medal. We, when you were doing the routine, were you thinking about doing the dismount, or did you agree that no, in, uh, with yourself beforehand, or you just crack on with it? It, it was a spur of the moment thing. Um, my coach will probably tell you the story and get a bit annoyed about it because I was still barely able to walk at the time. Um, like I said, I'm a, I love the power of bars and. Uh, yeah, I made it through this routine. And I had in my head like, if you get through this routine really clean, just just try it. Just like, it yeah. You can you can fall so over. That takes balls as well, it. knowing that that could end in tears. Yeah, and I, I hadn't practiced any dismounts at the time, so yeah. I knew I could do the dismount, but anything could have happened with the landing. Um, but I, do you know what? I, I stayed on my feet. I, I took a step. It hurt a little bit, but I, I come away with a silver or bronze medal at the time. And and again, I think that that showed my character, that showed my determination and it taught me a few things to be able to trust myself on this process. And on the lead up to, from that first competition back, surprising everyone with a dismount to being selected for the Olympic Games, like, so that first competition, the next competition was the British Championships. This time, no floor, no vault, but I was trying dismount. So I think that was only two or three weeks after that first competition, I fell on everything. And then from that, we'd already, because of our silver medal at the World Championships, um, we'd already qualified a team to the Olympic Games. Um, but uh, if you haven't qualified a team, you've got the Olympic test event. Um, because we'd already qualified a team, we had the opportunity to send one, two, maybe three individuals to gain a bit of experience. And lucky for me, that was myself. Um, it was, and it was Niall Wilson, one of my teammates at the time. And... Again, I was sent for experience. I fell on everything. Yeah, I was lucky enough to travel to Rio to be given the opportunity, but I I wasted it. I I fouled. I I fell on everything, but I learned a lesson. Again, next competition was meant to be the Europeans, and throughout this process, we've been told that the Europeans team will be the Olympic team, and I wasn't sent because of all the mistakes that I'd made previously. But I was given the opportunity to go and compete at a, a World Cup in. Bulgaria at the time I went I fell on everything again so again there was one last opportunity for me and that was a competition called the London Open this was really the time where I had to get it right and I went and smashed every single one of my routines but I come fourth yeah so that to me that was that was heartbreaking I thought at least I've done everything in my power I've I've tra trained the hardest I've worked the hardest I've smashed all my routines this time I can I can not be selected, but I'm con I'm content. I'm, yeah. I'm happy. But the way the gymnastics is selected, where it's a, it's a team, you're competing as individuals, but your scores come together as a team. The the makeups are the the first say three people that were selected. The two other people needed to complement the the people that already. So although I I only came fourth in the the all around part of that comp that final competition some of my parallel bars score my, my best my favorite piece was higher yeah my vault was higher so i was lucky enough to to be selected and and finally sort of i guess achieve my my lifelong dream so what was it like when you walked out for the first time realizing that dream can, it was, you, can you remember it was yeah i i, I will never i'll never forget it um <laughs> I can't I can't forget it like it's for me it was such a strange feeling like every you, you think being in an arena an arena full of hundreds of thousands of people you'd be nervous like you'd be absolutely pooing yourself yeah. like god I've I've got to make sure I do this. the most relaxed I've ever been really it, it was just like for me it was again it was that I finally done it like all this all this hard work paid off like I've done the work I trust myself I can do these routines like, I'm not going to waste this 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 is my dream and it's like it's it's finally here and uh, in the qualification I competed all six apparators 
in the team final, I think I only competed four. So we started on the rings, then I'd done the vault, the P bars, and then I didn't compete on the the high bar and the floor. So I went back to sort of the, the training gym. And again, one of, one of my memories that I'll never forget is it was myself and Lewis Smith in the back gym training, waiting for the final piece to come around, waiting for the pommel horse. And me and Lewis are having a bit of a, a laugh in the back. We've got Michael Jackson playing and we're, we're singing, we're dancing in the back gym while doing our last tiny little bit of preparation before we got back out to Pommel. And again, I think that's one of the things that, that relaxed me, that, that made me get through these, these routines and really in, enjoy the experience and take everything in. See, that, that's really interesting you say that because I think when you go into, and I've spoken to a couple of sports people that have been in arenas, whether it be boxers or footballers and stuff like that, and I, I'm always surprised at how relaxed these people say they are. And like you said there, you were really relaxed when, you, when you're in that pressurised situation. Is that down to just you being confident in your prep? Is that just wanting to enjoy it? Because for me, who's not been in that situation in professional sport, I would think that would be the bit where I would be absolutely bricking it. And the nerves would take over and I'd be shaking. And I'd be, you know, We've all had a lead up to something, haven't we? And it's like, I, I would think walking out in front of those people, I'd be super nervous. Like, But you didn't feel any nerves at all? You were more relaxed than you ever... What What do you think you're holding that down to? I think it, it was just it was the journey. Like, it's... Like people say, it's, it's the journey, not the destination. And I knew that all the hard work that I'd put in, I knew where I'd come from, from breaking my leg, being told that I wouldn't be able to attend the Olympic Games, and it was it was near to impossible to to then being there. Like for for me, it was like I've I've done it. Like yeah. I've, it's something I've never experienced before, and I, I've I haven't experienced it since. Yeah. I, I've never been that relaxed. Like all the all the competitions leading to the selection, I was so nervous. Like and especially when I was younger, I used to get so nervous that I used to I used to feel sick. I used to not speak to people the the day or so before. Like I'd really isolate myself and go into my shell. But the Olympic Games, like finally achieving that dream, it was it was something about finally being selected and just feeling so grateful and lucky. It's not luck. Like it, there was a lot of hard work and determination that went into it, but just something about achieving that dream finally that just relaxed everything. Yeah, no, I can. Now you've explained it, I can understand it. I think when you think about putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, how, how the hell can he or she be relaxed in that situation? But when you talk about, like you said, falling and learning for. Uh, falling forwards and learning and understanding situations. You've been through arguably tougher situations in your life than the situation you were in there. Yeah. And actually there's a bit of a euphoric moment because it's something you've achieved for yourself, for your dad, family. There's a lot of positive stuff that goes into that, which maybe, you know, your body's kind of computed and just thought, you know, it, it, the, the outcome is you being really relaxed and enjoying it rather than being uptight and stressed out about the situation when you probably won't perform as well as what you can. Yeah. Okay. Um. So... For any sort of youngsters getting into gymnastics, what would be your sort of top couple of bits of advice for people? I think the first one's got to be just get stuck in. Like you, you got to start somewhere. It's it's not going to look good. It's not going to look pretty. But you got to get started. You got to try. You've got to you've got to fall. You've got to learn. Yeah, that especially gymnastics. Going to a proper gymnastics centre, you're in a safe environment. A lot of the time, they've got mats. They've got foam pits. You've you've got the special coaches. Like everyone's there to to help you and make your your learning journey as safe as it possibly can be. Um, to just enjoy it. it again, like it's you're not always gonna do your best performances, but as long as you know that you're trying your hardest, you're working your hardest, and just taking in the atmosphere, whether that's at your first competition, whether that's even if you're not going down the competitive route, you're going into the gym, you're having a bit of a a social a laugh with your friends you're learning things you're enjoying your gymnastics and and great um and free just yeah like you, you're gonna fall you're gonna make mistakes but don't don't get down full forwards learn from things good you're a tattoo fan aren't you you like your tattoos <laughs> i do saw a few things on social media about this so you've got one tattoo tough times don't last tough people do yes so tell me about that 
Uh, that was my it was my first tattoo. Um, I just turned eighteen, uh, which would have been two thousand fifteen. Um, yeah, it's, it's the journey, the the hardships that I've been through. It was it was one of the quotes that I sort of lived by. Um, and you said you'd done your research into into me and the the hard way to success that sort of documentary about me and my life and that journey uh, through that period with with my dad. Um, that was yeah, it was the saying. It was it was my life motto, and it was something that that I wanted on me permanently to to remember. Like when times aren't easy, you just got. To, I'm I'm a tough person. Just keep going. Yeah, yeah, and I, I watched a, a few of those bits on YouTube, and um, I watched one this morning actually when I was working out this morning just to kind of get myself ready and get everything fresh for 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 yourself coming in. And um, yeah, there was. I like the the snippet parts of the videos that are on YouTube. There might be one that's like two minutes long. It was one minute fifty one, I think, and there's another one that's like eight or nine, ten minutes. And just listening to how you speak really well about those tough times and how you overcome them and that kind of mental strength and resilience. Um, when the podcast goes out, we'll, we'll tag those links in because yeah. even this morning, you know, I got up this morning, my alarm went at five forty. I couldn't be bothered. I didn't, I didn't want to go into the in, into the garage, but I'm up and. I might as well just turn up and see what happens. And I, I got, you know, walked into the garage and my head wasn't really on the game. I looked at the weights and they looked heavy. And I thought, <laughs> you know, do I really want to be in here? I could just go back inside and just go and get a drink, have a chill out and then take the dog out and pretend I've done it. But what I did do was I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a look with some of the YouTube videos that I looked on a few weeks ago with Bryn because I took quite a lot from it. And I listened to two or three of your YouTube videos, um, exactly the bits that you mentioned there. And that was my kind of start to get and, and by the time i'd listened to those youtube videos i listened to one that was one minute 51 at the start i was lifting straight away because again like i said earlier it was listen you know you've got to find your inspiration and your positivity and your motivation from somewhere and it doesn't matter where you find it but it matters that you find it like it, it, you rarely find that in yourself i think so i mean for me personally rarely do i find that motivation in myself i've got motivators but that do motivate me sometimes but i do quite like to look externally yeah. because then I see certain people that have had harder times than what I've had in difficult situations that are being positive, making choices, trying to take risks, trying to move forward and trying to, and being resilient. And I think I've got no excuse. Like yeah. just lift the, lift the fucking weights, like just get on with it. And, and that was kind of what I took from your videos this morning was listening to it with the injuries and different things that you mentioned in those videos. I said, look, you know, I've not had like really big injuries like that. And this guy's competing at top level, still cracking on doing it day in, day out, still having a passion for it, still moving forward, competing for his country. You just need to get your ass in gear and lift the weights. And when you do finish lifting the weights, you'll feel good. And at the end, I felt better for it. So it's kind of, yeah, we'll definitely tag those videos because yes, we do research and stuff, but I, I tend to listen to stuff that I enjoy. And I did enjoy those sort of series of videos on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you. So, I'm glad you... You took something from it and I got, got you to see your workout this morning. Listen, it's, uh, yeah, listen, I'm, I'm not, I ain't going to, I ain't going to have arms like you, mate, but um, <laughs> we'll try and do our best, eh? Um, so that's cool. So when we're talking about, um, you've got Commonwealths and stuff coming up yeah, in yep. Birmingham yep. soon. Yeah. So when do they start? That's a few weeks away, isn't it? Um, we, we're due to leave um, for the village, I, I believe, on the, the 22nd of July. Yeah. So what's the kind of goals, aspirations for you? What's next? Um... The Commonwealth is, is the last major competition that, to tick off my, my list. I, I've been to the Europeans, both as a junior and senior gymnast, been to the World Championships, been to the Olympic Games. The, the Commonwealth is the only major that I haven't been to at the moment. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's again, it's, it's attending, it's, it's knowing the, the journey that I've been on to, to get there, all the hard work that I've put in and really enjoying the atmosphere, the experience and the, the, the competition as a whole. Um, in terms of results and stuff that I, I'd be hoping for from it, obviously I'd love to come away with some medals. Um, I'd try something that I've, I've been trying to work on with. Again, I'm lucky to have access to it at the moment by psychologist and psychiatrist is not just thinking about the, the outcome goal, um, thinking about sort of the, the 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 progressions, the little stepping stones in yeah. order to achieve that. So at the moment, I don't know what those little 
stepping stones look like, but it could be something as simple as make sure you keep legs together, point your toes, like thinking about all those little things because if I can get them right, then it's probably going to have a good outcome. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think this is one of the strongest teams that WOWs have have put out and have selected. So, uh, again, I, I don't want to jinx it and anything can happen on the day, but I, I'd love to come away with a team medal. I think that will... It'll just be it'll be crazy for 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 Welsh gym, gymnastics and just sport in Wales as a whole. Um, for for me now, it's about inspiring the next generation to take over and it, even better our results. Um, so I'd I'd love to create that environment as as a team and and be able to sort of hand that over to the next generation to carry on. But as an individual, um, the parallel bars. My favourite is my best. You know, I'd I'd love to come out of a final and a medal on that event. Um, and again, it's I think we've we've only ever had one medal um, for the, the men's side of gymnastics in in Wales, which was David Eaton, I, I think, on the on the high bar. Um, I, I can't remember what year. So I'd love to to match that result, if not better it, hopefully over gold. But again, like I. I You'd never know what's going to happen in a day. I, I know that I'm capable of it, yeah. but I, I've got to make sure that I, I do everything I can to be able to come out with that result. And yeah, I'm, I'm training as hard as I can. So Is training crossed. going well? Yeah, training's been great. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't ask for more at the moment. I'm I'm doing the numbers. I'm making sure everything's getting done to, to a good standard, a good quality. Um <laughs> On the lead up to this Commonwealth Games, obviously you've sort of got multiple competitions that will be used for selection to to get into the team. And when we've looked back at the scores from these events that have been used for selection, comparing them to the last Commonwealth and the Commonwealth before, you know, my my scores, especially on the parallel bars, are, are in contention for for that final and even medal. But I just got to make sure that I. I put my best routine and my, my best work in on the day yeah no look I, th I think you know some of the things that I've taken from sitting down with you today in terms of that mental resilience and toughness and hard work and preparation and quality of work no matter what he's thrown at you I, I th look you know more about it than me but you know yeah, I think anyone stands a chance <laughs> um, you stand a chance certainly with your attitude and track record and kind of the the hard work and resilience that you've put in given some of the curveballs that have been thrown over over the last few years. So, yeah, definitely wish you well. And um, I'll definitely be tuning in just to see how you get on on those parallel bars, <laughs> see what impressive dismount you can you can pull out. I still, I mean, still looking at the, the bars, it's crazy, the kind of technique and how intricate the dismounts are to just land with your feet tucked together. Yeah, stationary. I, I still think it's one of those things that I look at in gymnastics that just looks impossible. It looks like you need to do that. You know, that's like a one in a thousand outcome. It just looks so impressive. The kind of level of intricacy when you're going through the air, spins, turns, twists to just come to a dead stop. It looks neon impossible. Uh, yeah, you're talking about fractions, about little little margins yeah. between perfection and disaster. Yeah, like you, you can go through a routine. It can be clean, but the smallest of things, like a a flex for a little split in the legs, can mean the difference between a gold medal and and coming last in that final. So it's really yeah, like I said, about working hard, making sure you get the numbers in, a good quality work and practice, and making sure you're doing yeah, the the perfect execution and training because you can't expect not to practice not to do something once and then pull it off in the day like the, the more times the more numbers you've got in your bank hopefully the the better that it will pay off on the day better the outcome is yeah definitely good well look, I, i've taken loads of things from our chat Bryn. really appreciate you coming in i think that whether you're into gymnastics or not into gymnastics some of the things that you mentioned about your personal um situations personal life upbringing going into your sort of elite career and challenges that you've had and successes that you had i think there's you know so many parallels with with people to kind of come away and think about their own situation and take some real real positivity from it and like i said you know the positivity the 
um, resilience, the mental toughness to deal with some of the things that you've done and, and keep competing at the high level is, is my takeaways anyway from, from the chat. So I really do appreciate you coming in. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to you, Bryn, to find out a bit more about you or maybe send you some messages of support um, or hopefully congratulations after the Commonwealth Games is done if you come away with a medal. And um, where can people find you? Uh, all, all social media channels, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, at Bryn Bevan. So it's B-R-I-N-N, Bevan, B-E-V-A-N. Um, and then Facebook is uh, Brim Bevan OLY official. So, yeah, reach out and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for having me on. Perfect. Thanks very much.